Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt. I'm a 11-year papillary thyroid cancer survivor from Seattle. This session is entitled Extent of Surgery for Primary Thyroid Cancer and Recurrent Thyroid Cancer. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan S. Ho. Dr. Ho is director of the Head and Neck Cancer Program and co-director of the Thyroid Cancer Program at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. His research interests include cancer proteomics, HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancer pathogenesis, and thyroid cancer molecular assays. Dr. Ho earned his medical degree at Stanford University, where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa. He did his residency at Weill Cornell, New York Presbyterian, and his fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And with that, I pass you over to Dr. Ho. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to everybody here in person and, and virtually. Um, I was given the opportunity to talk about extensive surgery, and it was a broad ranging topic. And I just want to maybe could I just ask whoever's here, at least in person, um, who who's had surgery already? OK. Um, all right. So I think that'll be, <laughs> help me set the tone um, because I, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on things that may not be of interest to you. But I think um, the, the things I will cover uh, will be of relevance to you. Um, uh, especially when it comes to the details of surgery and maybe the things that happen once you guys fall asleep under, <laughs> under anesthesia. So it'll help you kind of understand things. And maybe if, uh, if you ever do need to have recurrent uh, or uh, revision surgery, uh, uh, it'll make more sense what, the, what the, the surgeon is trying to say. Sometimes we are definitely at fault for uh, over talking about what we're going to do that in a way that is not easy for you to understand. But after today, hopefully you'll be armed with that information. All right. I have no financial disclosures. Um, this uh, is a Greek philosopher, philosopher Heraclitus. Uh, he uh, he is a uh, Greek philosopher who uh, believed in um, uh, change uh, and universal flow. And he would say uh, there is there is nothing permanent except change. Um, and I think that's uh, true with, uh, with much in life, but also with uh, thyroid. Um, care and also thyroid surgery, right? Um, and what I mean is, thank you, what we would do back in the 1990s or the 2000s um, may be very different from what we do today. So I, I find that patients who've had revision surgery, um, you guys are a different phenotype, a different beast than someone who's never had surgery, or maybe even someone who's had, had one. That's why you're right. That's why, <laughs> that's why you're on the side of the room. And um, a lot of people before I get into my actual talk, we'll wonder why, right? Why? Like we thought this was a very uh, low risk disease. Uh, we take care of your thyroid and we're done. Um, but you found, uh, to be honest, that many times there's other disease that's lurking and that there's a high percentage of recurrent or persistent disease that, sh that shows up later. Um, it's a very tricky and a very, it's a, it's a very curious disease, right? On the one hand, it's very low risk. It's um, unlikely to be lethal. Okay. Uh, on, the, uh, on the one hand, it's very low risk, and we think, oh, it's, it's, you, you do this and you're done. On the other hand, it kind of lurks around. It kind of continues. In your case, you had probably a lateral neck dissection. Um, and in most cases, that, so that means you probably had a lymph node that spread to that area. Right. And you, you eight out of 32. And so for many other cancers, this is perfect um, in terms of trying to under, help people understand. For many other cancers, eight lymph nodes out of 32 removed, you know, that's a very, very advanced. It's very um, difficult for people or, or physicians to treat, and I'm talking about other cancers. But in thyroid cancer, as they continue to tell you, um, that it's not as uh, dramatic or, 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 or advanced as it may seem on paper. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to explain that to you today. And also that kind of help guides what we do as surgeons when we think about doing revision surgery or, or additional surgery. Okay. All right. So the big picture that we like to frame for our patients is that thyroid cancer relative to other cancers um, do well. I think um, you still have, I, this happened yesterday when I was seeing a patient, they saw uh, uh, an oncologist who I think was in their 80s and they said, you have to have, you have to do the whole thing. You got to get radioactive iodine, you have to have surgery, you have to remove all these lymph nodes. Um, and she just had like a very tiny little cancer. And I think physicians to uh, our detriment, um, uh, we were taught uh, in the 1980s and 90s, that perhaps all cancers are the same. All cancers need aggressive treatment. They need to be annihilated, right? But in truth, we kind of understand now that um, there's a spectrum. There's a hodgepodge of cancers, and thyroid cancer is not necessarily 
um, doesn't necessarily need to be annihilated. So the worst prognoses for uh, cancers include pancreas, lung, and, and liver. The best prognoses uh, belong to thyroid, prostate, skin, and melanoma. And over time, we've seen that uh, from the 70s to the 80s to the 2000s to the 2010s, that patients have done well over time. So 92% survival, 94, 98. Um, this is a, 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 a table looking at all the different cancers, pan cancer across all cancers. And you can see all stages across uh, thyroid cancer does very, very well. You can see that it's 98%, um, 99 and 98% for a local, and even patients who've had regional disease, eight out of 32 lymph nodes, the overall survival is 98. That's if you, if you talk to a esophageal cancer patient or a colon cancer patient or an oral cavity patient, they would love those, they would love those numbers. And, and so I, I never tell people that um, cancer is good. I, I just tell people that the prognosis is excellent. And that kind of helps make people relax a little bit more in a way that I think um, helps, helps people all kind of get everybody on the same page, all right? Um, and that explains why, although on an individual level, everyone is different, on a population level, um, a lot of these big institutions and organizations are starting to pivot. They're trying to de-intensify or de-escalate in a way that may be puzzling to individual patients. In 2017, the US Preventive Services Task Force recommended against thyroid ultrasound screening. There's the American College of Radiology that had this TIRADS set up, which more or less recommended against needle biopsying any small thyroid nodule. The World Health Organization in 2018, they downgraded a cancer, one of the subtypes of papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with the type, but it more or less said that it used to be called cancer, but we're gonna say it's now benign because it never spread, it never um, grew, it never killed anybody. So I think they're trying to really sort of make people just more relaxed about the whole process. And then what we're gonna talk about today for American Thyroid Association uh, and guidelines is that they recommended that for the first time in 2015 that smaller, Cancers less than four centimeters can get hemithyroidectomy. Can I ask what kind of surgery you had? A hemi. Okay. Okay. So, oh, for hemi for anaplastic. Was it was it found after the fact? Ah, okay. I've had several of those. Okay. Well, we're glad that you're here. And and there was no there was no uh, discussion of completing the surgery for the other side. Wow. Where were you treated? Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I'm very, very pleased to see you. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear your story. So this is uh, percolated throughout all of thyroid cancer management in 2023, across every little facet of the steps of what we do. And I'm sure you guys know these steps. It starts with an ultrasound. There's an FNA, perhaps surgery. You might have adjuvant treatment like radioactive iodine. And then there's a the management of if the disease, if it comes back. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these, but there, the, the, co the consequence is there are all these new systems, TIRADS, Bethesda, molecular testing systems, surgery types, staging changes. All of these have um, led people to, to say that um, uh, you have a choice when it comes to extensive treatment, and in our case, extensive surgery. How is the U.S. doing with this new mindset? Well, for very small cancers, you know, the very smallest of the small, micro uh, papillary carcinoma. How, how large was your cancer? Oh, geez. Okay. No, that's not you. Um, well, we're not talking about you at the moment, but population-wise, for the very smallest of cancers, after we have started to pivot, um, you can see that from 2004 to 2016, I'm sorry, there's no one in this room that's, that, that, that is in this generation. Everyone's after. Oh. Oh, no, for the, for the, age, the, the time, the, the window from 2004 to 2016. Um, they, you can see that radio iodine, the amount of radio iodine that's given, which is in the dark blue circle, has started to drop. Um, imagine in 2004, if you had a very small one centimeter thyroid cancer and your doctor wanted to give you radioactive iodine, but that was the case in 20% of cases. So nowadays, you can imagine uh, it would be, uh, people would scratch their heads a little bit about that these days for just a very, very small cancer. Um, but on the other hand, the hemithyroid, which is what you had, um, uh, it's still only about 20% of cases, at least in the U.S. Uh, maybe that's why you're in Canada. Okay, so the larger tumors, one to two centimeters, you can see even fewer patients are getting hemithyroidectomy. Um, and I think it, what it means to say is we as physicians, we as surgeons, um, we sometimes are slow to change. We're very slow to change. Um, I, and um, unfortunately, what it means is when there are new, there's new thoughts, there's new data, there's new science, um, uh, uh, the, the clinical practice doesn't change with a flick 
of a, of a switch, it takes some time for everyone to adopt to it. But it's not our fault always. It oftentimes is a decision that is made with the patient. I'm sure that's what happened in your situations that led to the ultimate decision of what kind of surgery to do. All right, so let's focus on surgery. And when this, was, when this came out, when they talked about doing less surgery, hemithyroidectomy for smaller cancers, it was considered by um, Brian Hohen, who was a senior author, a big guy. Actually, he's in Colorado, he's in Denver, uh, to be the most controversial change that uh, uh, any guideline had ever uh, done to date. Let's talk about the extent of surgery. You guys, probably, at least in the crowd, probably understand um, how this works. I was trying to imagine what kind of crowd we would have today. So I, I, I put up a, a sample patient. Um, sounds like maybe in, maybe in, in Zoom we'll, we'll have such a patient. But it tells you about um, the, 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 the challenges uh, that we as surgeons and you as patients have to think about um, um, because many times people just consider uh, surgery to be one and done, but it may not always be the case, especially when you do less of an operation. So if you have a, a relatively young lady, um, I'm in my mid forties now, so I consider 41 to be very young, um, a female with two centimeter palpable thyroid carcinoma. So, you know, kind of small to medium size, but she has this contralateral eight millimeter nodule that is really making her worry, right? Um, she had a lymph node ultrasound that showed no, no um, uh, cancers. And then, so the question was, what do you recommend? Um, so today we would uh, offer either a hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy, but it would be a long conversation in the clinic. Um, many times patients will come in with one idea and they'll come out with another. Um, uh, the, uh, to, set the, to set the table, um, the current standard is if you have a small cancer, less than one centimeter, you, uh, they, 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 there's really no choice to do a total anymore. Unless there's other extenuating circumstances, we usually recommend a hemi or a partial thyroidectomy. It's also called lobectomy. Age is a, uh, it comes into play a, uh, somewhat. Um, thyroid cancer is, uh, it's unique. It's, it's no other cancers like this where staging is determined by age. And the cutoff is age 55. I'm not going to ask. I, I know better. My wife will. My, my wife tells me never to ask. So uh, anyone over the age of 55 is in a different staging system than anyone under the age of 55. Um, it, with the idea that, um, that we've realized that young patients do fantastically well, phenomenally well, such that um, they cap the staging for young patients under the age of 55 to stage two. You can't get better than that. Anaplastic's different, but for papillary, uh, you can't get better, worse than stage two. And that's really to calm everyone down um, and that to show that the prognosis and the survival is better. Anyone over the age of 55, um, you can get to stage four. The disease is supposedly, to some degree, a little bit more aggressive. So that may have played into why you were offered a total thyroidectomy. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Again, you got papillary. Yeah, I think uh, uh, again, it, it comes down to um, patient preference, physician comfort, uh, judgment. Um, like such, some people think age is 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 a significant uh, issue, um, and also just expertise. Um, if you do in, and see hundreds and hundreds of these kinds of cases, you kind of understand, have a better understanding of the, the natural history of the disease. And maybe there is some sense that your surgeon had that this is um, a more aggressive subtype that we have to deal with. And I'll cover, I'll cover that. It'll probably make more sense as I go through this. Um, so why did we switch from hemi to total? Well, uh, uh, if I can just uh, put on our scientific hats for a second, it came down to a couple uh, amongst other uh, papers, including one at Northwestern by a guy named Dr. Bill Amoria. He looked at thousands of thyroid cancer patients, 52,000. And he found when, he, when you look at how long they lived after 10 years, that the total thyroidectomy patients did better. 98% um, of them were alive after 10 years. Whereas if you just did the half, the hemithyroidectomy, 97% um, did better, or, or we're still, we're still around. Similarly, uh, this would be meaningful to you in terms of recurrence rates with, with the cancer came back. Now about 10% of the cancers came back if you just did a partial thyroid, uh, whereas if you did the whole thyroid, only about 7.7%. So this is one of those things where um, we say, well, look, therefore, total thyroidectomy is better. You know, but is it? Because statistically, it was better, but the difference is, you know, 1%, 0.5%. It doesn't necessarily mean it's clinically significant. Um, as in, if we took 100 of you, um, one, you know, one, you'd have to do 100 total thyroids to get one person or two, or two, two patients to, to say that that was better. Um, and is doing 100 total thyroids worth all the nerve paralyses and all the hypoparathyroidism cases and all the likelihood that you have to be on Synthroid for the rest of your life? There are a lot of different factors that come into play. Um, and that's why it's, it's kind of messy, like just like life is messy, 
right? Um, uh, choosing what kind of surgery to do can be messy. Now, what happened later, five years later at Duke, a guy named Dr. Adam looked at even more patients, like 61,000 patients. Um, he did much more statistical wizardry and found that, yes, at first, total thyroidectomy did better, although it's pretty like pretty close, right? 97 versus 96. But then he did multivariate analysis. What that means is he accounted for things like, I'm going to go to age again, um, comorbidities, like do you have heart disease, diabetes? Have you had a stroke in the past? And also how bad the tumor was, right? Was it anaplastic versus papillary? And they found that the multivariate analysis showed there was no difference between partial and total. So that's what kind of drove a lot of um, the, the decisions to now why uh, oftentimes a HEMI is, um, is, offered, is offered. But you can see that um, HEMI versus total is reasonable for either. And there, there are advantages and pros and cons to either. You do a total and it can facilitate giving REI. Did you get REI? Right, so one of those things you can't find out until after the fact, but if you did a partial and you needed REI, then it would have not been feasible, if that makes sense. Um, it also lets you use thyroglobulin, which is a blood marker, a biomarker to detect recurrence. If you do a hemithyroidectomy, you actually get a chance to minimize the risks of all those things I was talking about, hoarseness, hypoparathyroidism, and then the possibility of not needing Synthroid for the rest of your life. And in light of the fact, and this is come back to those two, those two curves I was showing you, when total thyroidectomy has an unclear survival advantage compared to the whole, uh, a total. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about uh, anatomy for a second, because I think if you ever need to have recurrent surgery, you need to understand what the consequences are, or if you need if you have primary surgery. The recurrent lingual nerve. This is for me. This is why, um, even though I'm in my 40s, I have gray hair now because I I I, I am so meticulous and worried about these nerves um, because they are very finicky, very sensitive. Um, they have a mind of their own and they can be stunned at a moment's notice. Um, for me, they're the most important and critical part of the procedure because you know, I'm not a singer, um, you know, I'm not an opera singer or a weatherman or a podcaster, but you know, everybody uses their voice and it's important. Uh, it's uh, important if you do a central neck dissection. And for me, this is what I've learned over the years. When you have, not you of course, sir, but if you in pink, uh, but if you have a papillary thyroid cancer that's so-called low risk, or even if you're operating on a benign nodule, it's paradoxical, but the stakes are higher because you know it's not a cancer. So if you injure the nerve, then it it it, it, it hurts a little bit more, right? It's a little bit more like you know, darn it, right? That 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 was that was something we we wish we didn't have to do. Um, now the superior laryngeal nerve. Does does, it, does anyone ever when they spoke to you about surgery, did anyone ever mention this? Because I always find this to be very curious. The superior laryngeal nerve. Doesn't look like you guys are. You guys are looking pretty quizzical yourselves. This is um, interesting because it's also critical for voice projection and, and pitch. Um, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is this guy, this guy down here, but the superior laryngeal nerve is high up in this area. It's critical not for regular voice, um, and if everybody walked around with a microphone, it wouldn't matter. But it's important for voice pitch and voice projection, able to shout, able to sing at high registers. Um, to get to that whistle register that like Mariah Carey has, right? She's using that nerve um, to, to great effect. So it's perhaps discussed the least for thyroid surgery in terms of possible consequences, but honestly, it's probably injured the most. Um, and it's injured probably about 10 to 15% of the time. It's kind of small. It's not easy to see. Um, many times when we're removing the thyroid, these blood vessels here, uh, we have to tie them off. We have to cauterize them. I mean, and look what's really right next to it. What's, what's its neighbor? It's the superior laryngeal nerve. So if you imagine a small nerve that's hard to see and you tie off these blood vessels, you probably are choking off this nerve as well. Um, so when we sometimes see patients that say, um, hey, you know, my voice is fine, but I can't do certain things, it's probably because this nerve got impacted. Uh, injury may lead to difficulty singing high pitches, um, difficulty shouting. Uh, and what I hear most is when uh, people say, we, I, have, I have difficulty being heard when I'm at a no noisy restaurant, at a big party. Um, so anyway, this is uh, a nerve that uh, uh, is underestimated when it comes to surgery. The parathyroid glands, they're very important. Um, I've learned uh, uh, through uh, uh, hard uh, one experience that this is another very fickle, sensitive structure that's very easy to stun. You think, well, come on, there's four of them, right? Why do we, what, what's the big deal? But in fact, they're very, very difficult to identify sometimes. They're sometimes buried in the, um, uh, the thyroid itself. And um, either they can be accidentally removed with the thyroid gland if, if you're not careful, but more importantly, if you ruin the blood supply, this is why I like this, this image, if you ruin the blood supply, even if the parathyroid's still there, um, it can be damaged. And if it's not viable, 
and you don't see it in time, then you wake up and um, patients can be miserable with hypoparathyroidism. Does anyone in the room have hypoparathyroidism? Okay, good. So good surgeons, good surgeons that you've had. Um, I would say this is a the mo one of the more common sources of ER visits after your thyroid surgery. You go home, everything seems fine. It's a delayed response. And then suddenly you feel this um, uh, miserable tingling and it requires you to come back to the ER for like some IV calcium. Okay. And so for the patients who've never had surgery, the persons who've had, we're going to have recurrent or revision surgery, these guys are even more uh, at risk because there's scar tissue, there's um, manipulation. Um, these guys are no longer where they're expected to be, right? So they're kind of out there in the wilderness and in, in fibrotic tissue in the thyroid bed, and we have to find them again. Um, I really uh, like this slide. It, it's taught me a lot about uh, 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 thyroid surgery. Um, this is the North American Thyroid Cancer Survivorship Study. And what it shows when looking at 1,100 thyroid cancer patients, people like you, is that 33% of patients feel that their side effects are really not taken seriously by physicians, right? Like I said, oh, I can't really hear myself talk. Oh, but your voice is fine. Your voice is fine. Um, and also a quarter of patients feel that their side effects are not taken seriously by family. Um, if you look at these numbers on the, on the right side, this is what we quote patients before surgery. Um, and then this is what people really have. So more than 54% of patients feel that their everyday speaking voice or singing voice has changed, right? But that's not what what surgeons like me tell people, we say, oh, 5% of the time you're going to have voice changes. 10% um, of patients need to have some kind of treatment, uh, surgery, more surgery, medication, et cetera, speech therapy to correct their voice. We say it's 1%. 62%, um, this is people who've had radioiodine, they get dry mouth, right? We tell patients, ah, oh, it's nothing, right? It rarely happens, 1%. Uh, low calcium, hypoparathyroidism, needing pills for more than two months um, or readmission to the hospital, right? 31%. We say it's like, like it's barely on the radar, right? I mean, I, it's, not, um, it's not because physicians uh, are trying to mislead you, right? But I think uh, what it means is that uh, uh, thyroid uh, cancer uh, after effects, side effects are uh, uh, underestimated, right? There, there's something very real about this that uh, physicians need to be more cognizant of, all right? Um, and that's why I think physicians are starting to change tack and want to do less surgery, like less invasive surgery. If, uh, if I could try to bring it together so far, the big picture is that whether you do a partial or a total thyroidectomy is, gives you about the same survival benefit or prognosis. So then why, why do more and injure things more is what we would say. All right. Um, so the recommendation is you can do a hemi or total. The hemithyroidectomy, you oftentimes hear it called lobectomy too. It's the same thing. There's a, something called subtotal thyroidectomy where we're really close to the nerve. So the doctor or the surgeon doesn't want to injure it. So he leaves a little cuff, a little smidgen of, of uh, thyroid tissue there. And then there's total thyroidectomy where everything is eliminated. Um, this is important for you guys. Um, do, do you guys get your thyroid globulin measured? Right, right. So if you do a hemithyroidectomy or lobectomy, you can't measure it, right? It's impossible because Thyroid globulin is made by normal thyroid tissue. So it just completely confuses the picture. If you have subtotal, it's, you can measure it, but it's a little harder, right? Because these, these little smidgens are still making thyroid globulin. Um, and this is the problem. You're like, well, why did he leave that there? Or why did she leave that there, the surgeon? And it's because they'd rather leave a little bit there rather than make you hoarse, right? Um, now, you can still use thyroid globulin in these situations. You just have to trend it, right? So instead of zero, it might be like one or two. Um, and then a year later, if it's still two, then probably it's just normal remnant, it's nothing. But if it jumps to four or eight or 12, then it's probably not the smidgen, right? It's probably real thyroid cancer. So it's not easy to measure, but you can. And finally, with a total thyroidectomy, that's the best way um, the thyroid globulin should be zero. Yeah. We were asking, sorry, sir, before, before you came in, the, Mr. Guy in the White, um, Texas. Um, yeah. Did you, have you had surgery already? Oh, your wife did. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and did she, uh, she had her total, she hasn't had more surgery since, right? She's just being monitored right now? Okay, perfect. Okay, good. All right. Um, so in summary, the, the low back to me, it avoids risk to the other nerve, right? The other voice nerve, we, we call it the voice nerve. It avoids risk to the other parathyroids. Uh, and then I think a lot of people find this to be important. Uh, they have about a 70% chance of avoiding hormone uh, synthroid, right? Um, so are you, are you on synthroid right now? Even though you still have half a thyroid left? Because they're trying to suppress it, right? The cancer. Okay, um, but you, but you're not dependent upon it, which is I think the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, total therapy has sort of an unclear survival advantage 
over just doing doing half in the right cases. Whereas if you do total, um, there are some advantages that I think are very useful. One is that it facilitates the use of iodine, which some people definitely need, enables the use of thyroid globulin as a tumor marker. Uh, and then this is more of a convenience thing. Um, uh, if you have the other lobe and there's other nodules there, like I showed in that case, you don't have to ultrasound someone forever, right? Which I think is um, can be burdensome for patient and for, for physician. All right, so um, this is another thing that I, I think kind of makes me recognize that everybody's different. So there's a survey by the National Society of Anxiety Center, and it's like, what do people fear the most? Okay, so it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know, it's not really thyroid cancer related, but I think it's important. So number one is claustrophobia, right? If you go get an MRI or be in, a, in a closed room. Um, heights, that's me, it's called acrophobia. I can't stand heights. Uh, spiders, that's why you see them in horror movies all the time, right? Now we're getting to more important things, flying, right? Uh, I didn't really know that because obviously millions of people fly every year. Um, number two is public speaking. Um, it's easier because there's just a small, no, small number of you today. But yeah, I, I understand that. But number one is death, right? It's irrational, right? It's death, not just the, the dying, but also like the, the, the process of dying, right? People really, really don't really, uh, uh, they, they, it just makes them feel very, very icky. So in those cases, even if I tell you that the risk of dying from thyroid cancer is very, very low, right? It doesn't matter, right? Because the irrational sometimes overrules the rational. Because peace of mind sometimes, if they can do whatever they can maximally to avoid the possibility of death, even if it's a tiny amount, they'll do it, right? Not, not everybody, but some, some people. So I've learned over time to recognize what patients really want, right? And that will play into the extent of surgery, right? Uh, the consequence of doing less surgery is that 10% of the time you have to do a completion surgery. I'm really surprised you didn't. I'm going to talk to you after and find out the reasons why. Um, and I will say that patients really wish to w avoid a second operation. I'm sure it was very difficult for you guys to have to go back again for your operation. And you had some premonition, some expectation because of the thyroid globulin that you probably would have to have something back. It was somewhere, right. Got it, got it. A year apart, right. Now there are reasons why um, we wish we could know we should just do the total thyroidectomy up front. Uh, these are the reasons. Uh, if there was aggressive histology, something like anaplastic, right? I think if they knew you had anaplastic, up front, you wouldn't have had a partial, you've had a total. Uh, if there's extra thyroid extension, which is like it starts to punch through the capsule of the thyroid. If you know you have cancerous lymph nodes, you know, eight out of 32, right? Um, the molecular profiles, sometimes that on a molecular level, you can tell if it's a bad, a bad cancer, if you have distant metastasis, or if you definitely need to have radioactive iodine. The problem is um, uh, with the needle biopsy, which most people get diagnosed with, it's just cells. So uh, until you get the actual tissue, Many times you won't know that it's anaplastic, right? Or in this case, it's tall cell or columnar or solid. The ones in red are the ones that are high risk and therefore need a total thyroidectomy. So what ends up happening is the FNA cannot tell us this information. You agree to a heavy thyroidectomy because it's small, right? And then a week later you come back and they say, well, the path report says it's something else. We're a little surprised, but there's nothing we can do because we never had tissue in the first place. The, the advantage of the needle biopsy is it's non-invasive but the disadvantage is it doesn't tell us everything. Um, anyway, so this is kind of a, a problem in our, in our situation because we don't know until after the fact um, and there's nothing we can do at the moment. The other thing is it's uh, is extra thyroid extension and metastatic nodes. Now it's not always, now many times it is, um, if it's major extra thyroid extension or you have large lymph nodes, then you know. And in those cases, you need to have a total thyroidectomy. In your case, you had eight out of 32 lymph nodes that were removed, but how many lymph nodes were detected on, before surgery? like maybe one or two. What probably happened was they saw one or two, but then you had ended up having eight. And what happens is if you have one known uh, cancerous lymph node, the chance of the neighboring ones having microscopic disease are higher. That's why you have to kind of sweep the zone and not just berry pick one or the other. You got to get the neighbors. But many times the ultrasound can't detect those neighbors, those small guys. Um, and so many times you do a hemithyroidectomy, find you have cancerous lymph nodes on, on, uh, on the back end, right, under the microscope. And then they say you have to have a total. So those are the reasons. Now, some people say, well, why don't we do molecular testing and then just know if it's anaplastic or if it's tall cell or if it's something really bad. And the problem is um, right now, molecular testing is only done for those maybe nodules that you don't even know if it's cancer. Um, and the reason is the mutations define the risk or the odds or the percentage that it's cancer, but it doesn't define how aggressive it is. So even if they did do mutational testing on everybody in advance, it, it would not be very helpful. The only exception is this uh, very, very aggressive subtype called BRAF and TERT. If you have both of those mutations, 
um, then you definitely would need to have a very aggressive surgery. The problem is I think this is only about 0.5% of all thyroid cancer patients. So it's just not, it's not cost effective. All right. Also, when you have a BRAF or TERP mutation, oftentimes you already know it's bad, right? It's a huge tumor. It's eight centimeters, right? They have lots of lymph nodes already. So sometimes you don't really need the mutational testing to tell you, hey, this is not looking, looking good. Go ahead. The combination. Only the combination. Right. So about 60 to 70% of thyroid cancers have BRAF. Yeah. And some people think it is an aggressive thing, but other people don't. It's very, it's, it's very controversial. Our tumor bar was just going on over this yesterday. And I would say that uh, it's, the, it's the combo only, not, not the single BRAF mutation. Anyway, so these days, uh, whether it be because of uh, guidelines or because, honestly, it's probably because of insurance, uh, we do not do routine mutational testing for thyroid surgery because it's low yield and it's just not recommended. It'd just be too expensive, cost prohibitive. I'm, it's pretty, I'm pretty sure it's insurance. It's, they're just like, no, no. Okay. Um, you might hear about people who do a prophylactic central neck dissection. Did any of you have that done? Hard to say. Okay. That's where um, you have lymph nodes underneath the thyroid, but the ultrasound doesn't see them. Now, uh, that, this is another uh, situation where the extent of surgery when you um, go up. So as I was saying, we're kind of leading toward less, but some people are doing more. They're doing a total thyroidectomy and they're taking out all these lymph nodes at the same time. Um, that's because, as I was saying, this is a very funny disease, even though it grows slowly, about 25 to 50% of the time, it's already spread to a lymph node. You just don't even know it. It's like tiny, it's microscopic, or we call it occult. Um, and anyway, so the, uh, for some institutions, they feel that eradicating all those microscopic lymph nodes is important, right? And truly, it does improve local control, meaning it's less likely to come back, right? It does decrease the thyroglobulin levels after surgery. And it, you know, it, it tells us whether perhaps radioactive iodine is needed later. But and I think this is a growing consensus. And again, everything's like this Brownian motion. Everything's changing, like that Greek philosopher was saying. Uh, it doesn't appear to improve survival. So a lot of places are starting to stop doing it because it, it doesn't seem to improve your outcome. Um, it also significantly increases your low calcium or para, hypoparathyroid rate. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think I'm still a bit on the younger side. They, they, they're, they're calling doing a prophylactic, like upfront central neck to kind of be an old school approach which is meaning it's, it's probably starting to find its way out the door. Uh, a lot of the uh, guidelines say the direct effect on outcome when you do this is small at best. So um, that's why uh, you don't really see it as much anymore. And then finally, there's a lateral neck dissection. Um, it sounds like you had it, but it was the second surgery you had it for? Ah, okay. How many lymph nodes did they find in the central neck? Do you remember that had cancer? Six or so? But none appear to, right, so exactly like I was saying, it was just happened to be there. Um, and we're glad we got rid of them, correct, correct. Uh, and it never came back in that area, correct? I see, I see. So you're biochemically positive, but nothing structural in the area. Got it, okay. Dotate, so medullary, okay, okay. So similar, but not exactly the same. Got it, got it, okay. Um, a lateral neck dissection, we use, uh, only do this when there's obvious disease. So unlike the prophylactic or upfront, um, we only need to do these in about 10% of cases. Um, this area has about 20 to 50 lymph nodes. Many times people ask us, uh, you know, is it going to hurt us to, to remove all those lymph nodes? Uh, we often tell people there are about three or 400 lymph nodes in the neck. There's a lot of redundancy um, and losing 20 to 30, 20 to 50 is not uh, anything that people will notice. I think our my record for doing neck dissections like this, we've taken over like 100, 120 in a particular patient, um, and she doesn't know the difference. It, it, it's not like she's more prone to infection or sickness. Um, her neck looks exactly the same. So um, these are um, dispend expendable, especially if they're, they're being removed for good reason. Um, this is a somewhat typical area for it to go to the side. And there are important structures in this area, the nerve that controls the voice, the nerve that controls the shoulder, and the nerve that controls the tongue. And there's a nerve that controls the diaphragm. So those are all very important structures to preserve. Um, so we don't go here unless it is absolutely necessary. All right. Um, these days, um, again, the idea that everything is changing. Uh, we've moved on from less invasive in the incisions. So many people, I think I was taught to use something called a hockey stick incision. Um, yes, that's yours, right? It kind of went up all the way to the ear. But it, but it kind of angles up, right? Correct, right. 
So uh, that is, it's, it's a good incision. And I can't even tell, at least from where I'm standing. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they, people heal very, very, very well. However, uh, the, so the advantage of this is that you can get up to lymph nodes really high up here, almost near the ear. We call this level two, right? There are lymph nodes that come up here, but it's not common because the cancer is here. Most of the time, the cancer goes to the side or a little below, which is called level three and level four. So a lot of people these days will do just what's a transverse or apron incision where it just kind of comes up here, makes it look, look a little bit more like a skin crease. Um, uh, the advantage of it is that it's maybe a little bit more cosmetically um, uh, legit, um, but on the other hand, you might miss high nodes. Uh, I've, I've had that happen to me because we tried to make the incision a little bit more um, pleasing, a little bit pleasing. But uh, these are kind of the incisions. Some people now are just doing a small incision and then like a little incision up here. But I think that's getting a little too um, boutique, boutique. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about surveillance because this is where it gets kind of gets very gray. Um, but there are definitely a lot of good tools out there. For, for you guys to use. I'm assuming everybody gets ultrasounds and also thyroid globulin measurements. Uh, and every once in a while, we'll get, we'll get a CT scan, MRI. Dota Tate is a nuclear medicine scan uh, that is very, very important as well. So ultrasounds are the standard of care. Everyone else outside of thyroid world thinks ultrasounds is very low tech, but in fact, it probably is the best at looking for thyroid, thyroid lymph nodes and thyroid cancer deposits. It's not invasive there's no radiation. It's everywhere, like it's ubiquitous. You don't really need to you know, go to a special place for a dotatate scan, for instance. Um, but it is operator dependent. If you don't have, if you have a radiologist who does like maybe some ultrasounds of the liver and ultrasounds of the breast, and then every once in a while goes up to the neck, they're not going to be as detailed or as knowledgeable as someone who is focused on, on that. And that's, this is where it comes in down to um, many places, many, many recommendations is to try to go to a place that does a lot of these because the institution, when they do a lot of these, they, they're forced to become experts in something. Um, and they have too many thyroid ultrasounds to do, they can't, they, uh, they, they'll, they'll find someone to focus on it rather than um, do a little bit of everything, if that makes sense. Um, now that person who does the thyroid ultrasound, they probably suck at doing, you know, gallbladder or liver ultrasounds, right? Um, so there's, there, there, there are pros and cons to that sort of mentality. But for you as thyroid cancer patients, it's, it's, it's advantageous. Um, it doesn't really look well for trachea or extra nodal extension, and you can't really see deep, really far deep into these areas in the retropharynx or the retrotrachea. Thyroid globulin, uh, you know, we have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, you, you guys, obviously, it seems like it's, it's helpful. Um, it's really the most sensitive biomarker available, but it has major caveats. Um, if the thyroid globulin antibody is positive, then it's kind of a, a less useful test because the antibody kind of makes things noisy. It's also confounded if, you, if the surgeon left any normal thyroid tissue um, uh, behind because then you don't know if it's, is it coming from normal thyroid or is it coming from cancer. About one third of uh, thyroid cancers don't make it. It's weird. They just, they either they're very aggressive. Your pro yours probably doesn't make thyroid globulin, right? Yeah. And the way to think about it is it's so ugly. It's so deformed that it's forgotten the ability to make thyroid globulin, right? Whereas a normal thyroid gland is going to know how to make it. Um, so usually it's the aggressive subtypes that don't make it, right? So sometimes you have like cancer all out the wazoo and it's the thy thyroid globulin is zero when you have a recurrence and it's because um, it forgot how to make it, right? So it's not the best marker in that sense. However, if it's low and stable, it's generally considered safe to monitor. It sounds like that's your situation. Um, and then a rising calcitonin for you, right? And a rising thyroid globulin, like doubling time, et cetera, like calcitonin is a sign that the cancer is starting to grow. Um, a CT, we like it a lot as surgeons. It can cover areas that, we, that uh, the ultrasound can't otherwise get to. Um, it's very sensitive for lung metastases that obviously ultrasound can't get through the ribs to get to the lung. Uh, but there is radiation. It has a radiated dosage of 1.2 millisieverts, which is a, about the amount of background radiation you get in five months. So not a lot, but it is, it is meaningful. Um, some doctors, I, I'm not a huge fan of this. They, they don't like the radiation from a, from a CAT scan, so they want to do an MRI. It's generally considered inferior. It's second line. It's good for maybe looking at the esophagus, but really how often does the can thyroid cancer go into the esophagus, and it's good for looking at brain metastases. But um, in, in spite of the good thing of it not having radiation exposure, um, it has very reduced sensitivity for looking for small disease, right? Um, which in many cases, that's what we're hunting for, right? If the thyroid globulin is rising, where is it, right? We don't want to use a substandard um, evaluation. So ultrasound and CT tend to be the, the advantages. There's whole body scans. This was used a lot um, back in the day. 
Uh, it was a primary role in surveillance. But as I mentioned before, they don't make thyroglobulin, a third of them don't. And so a third of them don't concentrate iodine either. It just forgot or it lost the ability. So I'm sure your anaplastic cancer, for instance, doesn't make iodine, doesn't, they don't do whole body scans. They don't even bother, right? Yeah, they just use like CAT scans. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, PET CT is good because it looks at activity. So if you're, um, if it's a very active cancer, then it'll light up because it consumes sugar. That's that's the, 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 the tracer that they use. However, um, it seems to able to detect tumors that are iodine negative. Um, and then using the combination of uh, whole body scan and PET-CT seems to detect almost all cancers. And as a high false negative rate, that, what that means is if something lights up, it could, it, could be, it could be anything. It's not a very smart scan, right? Like if something lights up, it could be cancer, but it could be because you have a cold. Could could be because you got a COVID shot and you had a, like a little reactive lymph node. It could be because I punched you in the neck, right? <laughs> All sorts of reasons, um, and that's why you really need to take a PET CT with a grain of salt. All right, does that does that make sense? I think um, people sometimes get very uh, amped up about PET CTs, but um, yeah. So this is this is a, a key takeaway, especially for recurrence. Yeah, the, 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 when people read the report, they don't know you. <laughs> they don't know that you have something in the in your back and then it's just a little you know mole or something. Um, Right, so these radiologists, they will say things and sometimes they don't, they don't, they're not aware of what it might mean to you, right? Oh, they think it's cancer. But um, I think what I'm trying to say is in the end, radiologists, they're sitting in a dark room, they've never met you before, they don't know your history and all the other things are going on with your spine. Uh, and ultimately, um, what they're looking at is pixels, right? It's pixels, it's not true cancer, it's just looking some, something on a screen that may translate to cancer, but it could translate to something else. So that brings me to, the kind of the more gold standard, which is an, a, an FNA or needle biopsy. Um, you, other than, uh, this, uh, in contrast to pixels on a screen, uh, a needle biopsy gets tissue or cells um, in order to get a clear answer, right? Is it cancer or is it not? So if you have something like that on your spine or somewhere else that lights up on a scan, an FNA is usually the next step um, to confirm what it is. So for thyroid cancer, and this is very important for recurrences, because um, there, there are a lot of things that could be just noise, um, and we try not to biopsy small lymph nodes, right? Because many lymph nodes that are that, are that size, they could just be reactive or just normal, right? They could be cancer, but they could also be, be normal. Um, so therefore, our guidelines say that anything that is biopsyable should reach at least eight millimeters in the central neck or more than 10 millimeters in the lateral neck before we, we act, before we, we, we attack you with a needle and try to get some tissue. Um, Anything smaller than that, even if it makes you really worried, we try to steer you clear of it because otherwise we'd be biopsying a lot of things that would otherwise not be useful, if, if that makes sense. And where do we get this number eight? Where do we get this number 10? It is a little arbitrary. It's somebody, a, a bunch of you know, uh, old wise men locked in a room and writing together some kind of guideline. Um, but now you kind of understand why they're saying it. They're just trying to avoid causing unnecessary worry, biopsying everything under the sun um, for something that may not really be, be, be that useful. Now, there is something increasingly that people use called washout or thyroid globulin washout. And that's because a lot of thyroid cancers, they're like uh, water balloons. They're like, they're lymph nodes, but they're just full of fluid. And the fluid doesn't have the cells that can clinch thyroid cancer. But if you take the fluid and then you um, wash it out and rinse it and then send it for thyroid globulin, um, if that thyroid globulin is positive, then that's definitely thyroid cancer, if that makes sense. Because what is... What is thyroid globulin doing in a lymph node? It can only be cancer. Um, uh, thyroid globulin should only be found in thyroid glands. Right? Um, anyway, so uh, uh, there are no, in those cases, there's no cancer cells, but they're rich in thyroid globulin. And this really helps uh, when you're dealing with a very cystic node. Um, this, these are the situations where then we would think about doing surgery. Um, I do want to tell you a quick story about <clears throat> where ultrasound is better, where CT is better. I had a patient, she was 37, she was she had a thir three centimeter th papillary thyroid cancer. Her husband had, she, he, he owned an imaging center, right? He's very proud of his MRI machine, very proud, right? He's like, oh, I can find anything. I spent a lot of money on it. He got an MRI for his wife and he said, look, um, the report says there's no abnormal lymph node seen. Um, we're good, doc. We're just gonna do a little thyroidectomy and be done. But then when we did the ultrasound, um, the MRI missed this nine millimeter level two lymph node with, and then the, the biopsy showed cancer. So what this means is even if you have the best imaging center on the planet, right, even if you have all the resources at your disposal, um, certain scans are just not very good for finding this kind of cancer. Uh, in contrast, um, 
Oh, sorry. And then when we did surgery, uh, just like in your case, the eight out of 32, um, there were multiple five lymph nodes that the MRI completely missed. So again, just to know that the CT and the MRI don't really, um, and, the, and the ultrasound too missed four of them. Uh, it just shows that um, uh, there's a lot of microscopic disease out there. Then you have to just take out the neighbors, not just the, the, the target node. Uh, on the other hand, large disease really helps us when the ultrasound may undercall it. So when you have an eight centimeter cancer, an ultrasound's kind of, um, it's almost like bringing a knife to a gunfight, right? <laughs> like it's not enough. Right. This is the ultrasound of a, a patient of mine who had huge bulky cancer. You can see it from across the room. And so you, you get this like this gobbly uh, report from the ultrasound. I mean, I don't even want to read it. Um, but then when you get the CT, look at that. Right. There's like all this disease. It probably reminded you of your disease. Look at all this. Right. There are bulky, large nodes. And what does that tell us? Well, when there's large nodes, it means that we probably have to use a bigger incision. Uh, right. And probably a higher incision in order to kind of get up there. We'd have to do that hockey stick incision that you had, Nam, back there, right? Uh, it, it shows that this patient had tracheal deviation, right? So I have to make sure that maybe the trachea is involved and that requires a different kind of operation. It looked like that it was starting to extend down into the chest. So now I have to get the chest surgeons around just to be sure on standby to make sure. And then um, it's hard to see here, but this is the jugular vein, you know, the jugular. Um, and then in, on the other side, you can see that it's completely engulfed. You can't even see it. So we probably have to sacrifice that jugular vein um, and so that's an, another important consideration where this is where an ultrasound just doesn't do this, the, the patient justice. You have to have a CT. So that's why sometimes you'll see doctors do one or the other or both. Um, and it's because for these particular reasons. All right. So the, our current guidelines say that for uh, before any surgery, you should have an ultrasound. That's important, whether it's recurrent surgery or new surgery, because it will find the 25% of cancer patients who have small lymph node metastases, and it can see small disease that a CT can't see. Uh, on the other hand, a CT is recommended for a very large advanced disease because it helps guide our surgical planning so we're not surprised uh, and find out there's more than meets the eye. Okay. All right, uh, what time is it? Uh, okay, great. I'm gonna talk about uh, extended treatment for recurrent thyroid cancer. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's really a tough surgery, and uh, I, I, my hat's off to anybody any surgeon who uh, takes on these cases because the scar tissue can be very, very demanding. So we, uh, we always think of reoperation as never satisfying and always perilous. And unfortunately for thyroid cancer, although the, again, the prognosis is phenomenal for most cases, 25% uh, of the time patients will recur, such as the people in this room. The rationale to reoperate is to prevent invasion uh, and also to prevent seeding into the lung. And the rationale to observe is that, well, even though you, you uh, uh, reoperate 50% of the time, the thyroid globulin or the calcitonin is still high, right? As in your case, right? So after the, right? So like, what are you chasing? What's the point? Are we chasing a number or are we trying to chase, you know, impact, right? Um, thyroid, uh, calcitonin, thyroid globulin is to, to go after it and make it zero is sometimes an, an unachievable goal. And that's why sometimes we choose not to operate. We just observe. And finally, some people consider reoperation, depending on the case, they have no impact on whether you live or die, what, on what the survival prognostic is. Uh, similarly, let me just show you that the nerve paralysis rate is much higher in this particular case for reoperation. As much as 6% of the time, you'll be more hoarse. And then hypoparathyroidism rate, in some cases, is much higher as well. These are, these are much higher numbers than what you can see with primary surgery. Um, when we do the recurrent cases, um, we really kind of load the boat. We really want to make sure everybody's involved from the radiologist to the endocrinologist and the radiation oncologist because no one wants to go it alone and find out that um, there was a bad outcome and um, uh, other people would not have backed up the choice to do surgery. And I think that makes the patients feel better um, that the team is all in line to go after it. All right. Uh, and, and, and one person may temper the other's enthusiasm. Uh, the other, uh, another case is of a one, one team may, may encourage somebody to do surgery when they're, they're doubtful about whether it'd be useful. The factors to consider about recurrent surgery or revision surgery, uh, patient specific. If you're much older, probably not worth it. If they have a lot of comorbid conditions like cardiac disease, and if they've had other, like multiple other surgeries. And so we call that a hostile neck where going in is, is just gonna be really rough. Um, tumor specific factors, if it's a more aggressive cancer, it's worth coming back for and doing surgery. Uh, if it's growing, that's another sign that maybe more surgery is needed. And then the thyroid globulin or calcitonin levels in your case, if they're high or they're growing, uh, they're rising, then that's maybe another indication as, as you guys have already told me. 
Uh, finally, iodine avidity. If it's not iodine avid, meaning you can't give more radio iodine, then surgery is really the only choice you have left, right? Finally, there are anatomic factors. Um, if it's a really bad subtype, the number of locations, uh, the proximity to important structures like the recurrent nerve, and then whether you're trying to cure someone or just to palliate them. Um, here is the, uh, a number of papers that look at the outcomes after you do salvage surgery. So what I have here is biochemical information. So the chance that the calcitonin, the chance that the thyroglobin that goes down to zero, these numbers are not great. It's not 100%. 50% of the time it goes to zero, but you know, in this case, 73% of the time, the thyroglobulin is still high, right? Um, so I think uh, we always try to temper someone's expectations. Hey, our goal is not to get that thyroglobulin to zero. Our goal is to prevent um, you from having any, any bad outcomes, right? And, and in some cases, we will do things like say that, say that um, you, this, this is a disease you'll probably have to live with, but never like be cured from, right? And that's okay because you guys are still living your day to day and it's not affecting your routine. Similarly, um, uh, eradicating all disease that you can see and feel, it's not 100% either. Some cases there are, but in many cases, there's still disease that's, that's there that, again, it's not something anybody can see or feel. It's not affecting your day-to-day, -day, but it's still there. In contrast, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of complication rates, and we'll, we'll kind of, I'll kind of skip through that. Um, and these complication rates come from um, injuries to things like the nerve, right? So I just showed you the nerve here. And when you have scar tissue, Right? It's easier to stretch that nerve, to, to make that nerve unhappy. Um, and when you have primary virgin uh, a surgery, this is much less likely to happen. Okay? Um, here is just an a, 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 a illustration of how these nerves have to be dissected off of all these lymph nodes. It's not fun. These nerves, again, are very finicky and, and um, very, very uh, fragile and sensitive. So um, although these lymph nodes look like they need to be removed, you know, as I said, some of them are going to be normal. Right, and if they're not causing you any trouble, you know why bother the nice nerve that's been that's doing a good job for you. Uh, the nerves also tend to be extremely um, um, uh, uh, different, just like everybody's different. Different color hair, different height, different weight. Um, the nerves are all different. Sometimes they don't branch at all. Sometimes they bifurcate. Sometimes they trifurcate. Sometimes they branch in many different locations. And unfortunately, our our hands are human. Right, it gets to a point where we can't dissect all these things, even with a microscope, even with a robot. Um, there's nothing we can do. And so uh, many times these branches will get cut, right? And we don't want to do that if um, it's not going to impact your, your outcome. We do have something called nerve monitoring. I really, really like it. Um, some of the old school surgeons don't use it, but I, I find it to be es essential. It's this almost magical probe that you put in and you touch things and it tells you whether it's nerve or not. Did you have a question or? Oh, no, you're just scratching your head. Okay. Oh, good, 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 good. Um, and what happens is if you touch the, if you touch random tissue, it, it won't do anything. But if you touch a nerve, it goes beep, 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 and it just tells you that um, that it can really help find nerves, even if you can't do this. Uh, I'll give you a story. Um, earlier this year, my aunt had uh, a huge goiter, right? Um, and we thought, oh, well, no problem, we'll take care of it. But the thing is, I didn't recognize the nerve was so stretched and flayed that it was right here. But uh, fortunately, one of my teammates passed a nerve monitor through here, and it turned out the nerve was right here. I thought the nerve was further down in this vicinity, but um, I thought this, I, and what ended up being the nerve ended up, uh, I thought it was just like fiber fatty tissue. So um, I, I would have been in a lot of trouble <laughs> if that nerve got injured. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up, um, <laughs> and we see our family quite often. So uh, the nerve monitor saved, saved uh, a lot of grief uh, in, in, my, in my aunt's situation. Um, it also tells me that I probably should never operate on a family member again. It was very, very scary. Um, this is what it looks like if you injure a nerve. So the, the, the nerve on this side here is not moving, right? Whereas the one on the left is moving. And you can see that when the nerves don't come together, you get a little opening, right? a little gap, right? And when that gap is there, your voice sounds like this. It sounds very breathy and hoarse and gra Oh, okay. Um, uh, your, your wife is... We'll talk after. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that's what happens if one of the nerves gets gets stunned, damaged, or cut. All right. Um, uh, mainly ENTs do do uh, do these scope exams, um, but it uh, there are ways to fix it. Mainly by injecting the cord that doesn't move, so it gets it's pushed over and then the gap closes. Um, but even then, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, right? Because it's kind of like driftwood, right? It's just kind of sitting there. You'd rather them be dynamic. Um, anyway, so this is what happens when one of the nerves gets 
gets cut or damaged, uh, you get this breathiness because there's the, the gap is now no longer closed. Uh, however, sometimes we have to sacrifice the nerve, especially if the cancer is encasing or surrounding the nerve. Uh, before, when we all thought that all cancer was bad, we would always sacrifice the nerve, right? In the, in the interest of getting all the disease, annihilate the disease. These days though, we oftentimes will favor pres preserving the nerve if we can. Maybe not in an anaplastic case, but in most papillary cases, because we can wait for that radioactive iodine to, to clean it up. Also, if you're an elderly patient, if, if you don't have one of those nerves working, you're more likely to aspirate because uh, young people tend to be able to protect their airway a little bit better, but older patients, they can aspirate. It goes into the lungs, you get an ammonia, and then on, honestly, you can get septic and die. So for older patients, we tend to favor nerve preservation. We tend to favor sacrificing the nerve. It's an aggressive cancer. If we know that iodine's not gonna work, uh, if they've had radiation before, uh, and uh, those are the main reasons we would try to sacrifice. No, I rarely do it these days because I, 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 it, just, it just hurts me to see that nerve, that, that vocal cord not moving. Um, and I know that although the voice can be repaired, it's never 100%. Okay. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to wrap up and say that um, ultimately, when do we decide to offer for recurrent surgery? If we find that the disease is bigger, right, greater than 8 or greater than 10 millimeters. If we see the thyroid globulin is starting to double or be very, very accelerate. And if we see disease that's growing on the scans, those are uh, absolute reasons to go and operate. But we also have to wonder, is it gonna help, right? Is there any benefit from doing revision surgery? Is it gonna prevent further spread? Is it gonna decrease those thyroid globulin levels? Is it worth, worth it just to get that thyroid globulin level down? Uh, we try to avoid surgery in older patients. And if like you have bad heart, bad lungs, if you're a bad anesthesia risk, and also finally look at you guys and really what, what's your motivation, right? Is it something where um, the motivation is correct? Um, are they concerns that are legitimate? And we come to a decision together. Okay, so uh, the last thing is RFA. Have you guys heard about RFA? Um, for small cancers where um, you're not a good surgical uh, opportunity, it's just one. Sometimes if we're just trying to buy time, um, what we do is we um, consider putting a needle into um, uh, the nodule or the lymph node and just burning it. Um, that can buy you some time. It doesn't take care of those neighbors that I was talking about. And so it's still kind of controversial about whether to do it. But if, you're, if your grandpa who's 100 years old has a, has a lymph node and we're worried that it's gonna start eroding into something, but he can't have surgery, then we sometimes will consider something called RFA. Great, so uh, in summary, oh, uh, well, that's my summary. Thank you very much for your time, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, so the question just for the people on Zoom is that uh, his, his wife had surgery and the parathards went out, and you're at, he relocated them. Oh, so what was the rationale behind that? I see. So um, when you're doing surgery, um, sometimes the parathards, even in the best of circumstances, you move them and they start getting dusky, right? They start looking dark, black, like unhappy, right? So in those cases, it probably won't survive. So what we do is we mince them up right? And then we plant them into muscle nearby as a very favorable tumor bed, or, or sorry, a surgical bed. And then over one to two months, the blood supply gets nourished and the, and the parathyroids come back online. So, and so that's why we would, we would move them. You mean long-term? Oh, I see. So then uh, uh, we usually check your parathyroid level or calcium level after the surgery. And if they're low, then we start you on calcium. Many times it's just Tums, like what you take for indigestion. Um, and then there's another uh, uh, type of Tums called Tums with vitamin D. So that helps because vitamin D also helps bring the levels up. And then there's a, another prescription vitamin D medication uh, called Calcitriol. It's activated vitamin D, much more potent. Um, and so we would give that as well. And so those, that, those are the things we normally do to, to, to stem the tide. Thank you again for your time. I'm happy to take questions after offline, but uh, uh, it was really great meeting all of you. I learned so much from um, listening to you guys uh, and coming to this conference. It, it really helps calibrate you know, how I counsel my future patients. Thank you very much.